Ladies and gentlemen, be it known that on this third day of November in the year 2023, I, town crier, welcome you to the Newcastle University Central Coast Clinical School and Research Institute as we celebrate the Cristani Scholarship 2023 award! And now, on this great occasion, please welcome a damsel who is never in distress. You know who it is, your MC, Dr. Apsara Windsor! Thank you, Mr. Town Crier, and um, I'm going to put that on my CV, that I have now been announced by a town crier, but not any town crier. Um, just so you know, he was actually the national town crier champion of champions in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stephen Clark. Um, now, before we start the formal proceedings, I would actually like to invite Claire Bridgman uh, to deliver the uh, acknowledgement of country. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the shortcut. WHS. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we live and learn. We pay respect to them for the care of the land over countless generations. May the spirit of the dark and young clan be amongst us through the wind we feel on our faces, through the sounds and the actions of the animals, and through the energy of the sun that helps us to grow and learn. Thank you. So it was actually really good to see Claire today. Um, for some of you who may have been here before, Claire used to be the operational manager at uh, University of Newcastle, and then she actually buggered off to Sydney to do, take an operational manager role at the ambulatory uh, uh, care centre at the Northern Sydney Hospital. Um, but it's really good to actually see that you've actually maintained your connection with the Crestani Scholarships and also the Central Coast. Um, so on that note, I would like to extend a really warm welcome to all of you um, to the 10th annual Crestani Scholarships Award. Um, obviously, the Crestani Foundation has actually been going on for much longer than that. Um, but it's actually, again, you know, so good to see so many familiar faces in the audience. And it's also really nice to see some fresh new faces um, in the audience as well. So welcome. And I'd like to also extend a special welcome to a few guests, uh, Dr. Gordon Reed, um, MP and member for Robertson. Uh, Gordon just embarrassed the crap out of me by saying that he actually met me in 2015 when he was a medical student um, <laughs> under my rotation <laughs> when I was the head of Department of Radiation Oncology, so I feel old, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, and Liesl uh, Tesh, AM, MP and member for Gosford. Um, good to see you again, Liesl. And Tim and Jess O'Connor representing the Crestani Board of Directors. Now, uh, just a few housekeeping things. The toilets are out there somewhere if you need them. I don't know where they are. Um, but also, just please remember to turn your phones on to silent. Um, the event tonight is being videographed and photographed. So unless you want to be in the bloopers reel, behave yourselves. Um, and also, Sharon, the Cristani photographer, gets first dibs at all photos. So if you really want a photo, perhaps just wait until she's done her thing and then ask for one of the Cristani volunteers who would actually help you get a photo with whoever you need to get it with. Um, and so I think that's a housekeeping. Now, I would like to invite my little friend, or no, littler friend, Yvonne Cristani, to the stage. <laughs> So, so the, the joke always here is that Yvonne calls me her, no, she calls me her little friend. So even if she sends me a thank you card or a Christmas card, she actually writes to the little doctor on the envelope, which I'm, found, I'm assuming the postman finds hilarious. Um, and then I call her my littler friend because obviously she's tiny. However, the other day she actually did get to stand next to me when I didn't have my shoes, high heels on. 
and she discovered that I'm only as tall as my heels, <laughs> and I'm actually about the same height as her. So now we are kind of back to being equally little friends. <laughs> So um, first of all, I don't, I'm, I'm sure many of you are actually aware that Yvonne was honoured with the um, Order of Australia medal this year. So I'd like you to first of all join me in congratulating Yvonne for her amazing award. <laughs> and, and Yvonne is an extremely humble woman and she didn't want to really talk about the OAM at all. But since I'm the one with the mic and the MC next to my name, she doesn't get a choice. Um, so Yvonne, can you actually maybe just tell us a bit about what this honour actually means to you? Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll need this. Okay. Yes, you do need that. Um, so yeah, what this honour means to you and also the Crestani Scholarships Foundation. Thank you. Well, I think when I look around here, what this medal means is this belongs to everybody here because it's a recognition of what we do for the community. And whether it's myself with the volunteers or whether it's the people that support us, the donors, uh, so many people go into this project. So I feel the medal belongs to everybody. So, congratulate yourselves. Um, when I was presented to the governor, and you know, it was my big opportunity, and I, I really, I think I blew it because <laughs> I walked up to Her Excellency and the first thing she said is, what motivates you to continue doing this? And of course, as soon as she said that, my eyes filled up, I couldn't speak, and all this I could think of was cancer. So, that's what it means. <laughs> now, you made me cry. That's what I did. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, oh, you're so sweet. Um, as most of you know, um, Yvonne started all of this because of her husband, Chris Crestani, um, who did actually unfortunately pass away from head and neck cancer. And, um, and, but this is what it means to you. And, and well, I'm, it means to so many people here. I think everyone can relate to losing someone or having the diagnosis, which is the most awful thing. And if you just think about the friends that you've lost or the people that you know have been diagnosed, then you'll know that you've earned that medal. Um, so, do you want to, do you want mic? Okay. So, it's, um, yeah. Go on, you, you next. <laughs> you, she talks more than I do. This is, this is going to be an interesting night. Sorry, people. Um, so, um, well, one of the things that I actually so wanted to actually say is that when I did actually mention the OAM and whether I could actually ask her some questions, she actually mentioned to me that, in fact, there are at least six OAMs in the audience. And I just thought, and geez, this woman hangs out with some distinguished people. Um, but I think one of the things that actually kind of that highlighted to me was that you're not actually brought together just because of your titles or your egos about whatever this means. What actually brings all of you together is actually your common purpose in actually serving someone beyond yourself and serving the community. And I think it's also really wonderful to see um, every time I come to one of the Crestani Foundation um, awards or any of the um, events, what you actually notice is that literally all of the leaders of the community and all of the leaders of different charities and organizations are here together. And that's uncommon because com commonly there's always a rivalry between the, particularly when there's funding involved. There's always a bit of a rivalry going on and people don't come to this event and that event. But I think again, it's an amazing uh, uh, thing to see that everyone comes together to support each other in actually supporting the community. So I want to actually kind of get everyone to congratulate the OAMs, but also everyone else in the audience who actually kind of give themselves to the community and the betterment of our patients. Let's put the hands up the OAMs. Yes. Um, if you are one of those OAMs, could you please put your hand up? 
I see you. <laughs> see you. <laughs> well, there you go. Well done. Well. <laughs> so the next question, Yvonne, is, uh, you know, you've got a whole lot of money from your foundation. You've got an OAM. So are you finally going to try and retire after actually retiring 20 years ago and, you know, go to the Bahamas or something and put your feet up? Or what's the future of the Crestani Foundation? Well, that's all right. Um, often I'm negotiating with people by email and by telephone for months before we actually produce something. And I get to know them on the phone and, and emailing to and fro. But then when I turn up um, to a function, as I did in Coffs Harbour recently, um, people talk, take one look at me and they go, oh, she's not going to last. <laughs> So I can assure you, we have a very formidable board of directors and we have a panel of advisors and we have a wonderful, wonderful group of volunteers. So I can assure you, everything is in good hands. Um, apparently Lucky does this as well, but when I call her at 7.30 in the morning on my drive up, if she doesn't answer, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's dead, you know, because <laughs> she always answers. <laughs> and so three times, and if she doesn't answer, I'm like, oh my gosh, I call someone else. Um, but <laughs> Lucky does that, you know. But, he but ring, on... <laughs> rings me, and if I don't answer the phone, he leaves a message, and then I come back and I'm too busy, so I don't return the call. And then the next time he rings me, he, he abuses me because I'm not dead. <laughs> so. But on the other hand, um, a long time ago, Yvonne did ring me, maybe this was during COVID, and she asked, if I die, could you please do my eulogy? And I sort of said, the way you're going, you're going to have to do mine. So <laughs> we'll make a mutual pact, and, you know, whoever dies first, we'll do the other one's eulogy. Um, so now that we've actually got that reassurance that the Yvonne Crestani Foundation's going nowhere, and actually Yvonne's also not going anywhere, um, what have you achieved in 2023? What were the scholarships that you planned for? What are the new initiatives that you've actually thought through this year? Yes. Well, we have um, some radiation therapy students who you will meet. And we have two that are going to the Central Coast Cancer Centre where Cathy will look after them. And we have one um, doing an MRI course. And we have a young man, which I have, who I haven't met yet, but uh, from, uh, he's a, doing, he's from rural area. I think he's from Dubbo, is that correct? Yes. yes. Um, then we have, uh, we have a special funding for areas outside of the Central Coast. Like um, we've had funding for Coffs Harbour and Port Macquarie and we're going to branch out with those, that special funding that we have. Yep. Um, and I think the other thing that I... Um, if you could actually just mention in terms of a new initiative that you're actually having with APRASIG. Um, so this is something a bit close to my heart. Um, but perhaps, so APRASIG is the Asia Pacific Radiation Oncology Special Interest Group um, that was founded by Professor Graham Morgan um, through the Radiation Onc uh, College of Radiation Oncology. He was the previous director of Royal North Shore Hospital. But perhaps, Yvonne, you could actually tell us how you knew Prof Morgan and what he meant to you. Professor Morgan treated my husband because they worked together for many years at St Vincent's. And when my husband was diagnosed, we happened to be away. I think we were in Nelson's Bay. And I got the message and I said, what do you want to do? He said, take me to Graham Morgan. We got in the car and we went straight to North Shore. And it, just a little bit of interest that um, Professor Morgan did the eulogy for my husband's funeral. So, hmm. um, so before I make you cry again. Um, <laughs> So, so Graham Morgan, um, I've met him only a couple of times. I think he was very much in his senior years of his career. I was probably, you know, um, yeah, high to a grasshopper when I met him as a registrar, a young medical student. He was a bit like Yvonne, tiny, tiny, but packed a punch. 
Um, and when you met him, you kind of immediately got that sense. He wasn't someone who was doing radiation oncology just to do a nine to five job and do some clinical work and go home. He had a much broader interest about the world and bettering the, um, the, the, the uh, outcomes, not just of Australian cancer patients, but the world. So he set up APRASIG, um, and since then, that has actually become a special interest group in radiation oncology. I was at the college um, annual scientific meeting last year, and they announced his passing. And when, he, when that was actually mentioned, I called Yvonne straight away and sort of said, look, I don't know whether you actually had heard that Prof, Mar Prof Morgan had passed, but wouldn't it be wonderful if you could actually do something to honor his legacy and what he has done and what, you meant, what he meant to both you and Chris, uh, Chris Cristani? Because often what we find is that, you know, as people have actually become senior in their career and then they do pass, a lot of the juniors don't even know who they are. They don't know what their legacy is. They don't know what they have actually achieved and left for the world. Um, and so I asked uh, Yvonne and the Crestani board of um, members whether they could actually consider a scholarship. So for the first time this year, um, now I need to actually get their names. Um, Toby. Uh, so Toby Lowe and Glenn Newman were awarded a scholarship to um, go to Mongolia. So Mongolia, for those of you who don't know, is, it has a very high incidence of liver cancer. Um, and liver cancer has a very, very effective treatment, particularly if it's actually identified early with stereotactic radiotherapy, which is extremely high energy focused radiotherapy. Um, the project is actually funded by IAEA, which is the International um, Atomic Energy Agency. So it's an extremely high powered project. And for two young Australian radiation therapists to actually have that opportunity to go there and not only help the Mongolian people, but to also actually kind of help advance their careers is absolutely invaluable. And these are the people who will not only become Australian leaders in radiation therapy, they will become global leaders. So I want to again thank Yvonne and the Kristani Foundation for actually supporting that initiative. I think, it, I think it's a great opportunity for two of our radiation therapists, the one from North Shore and one from Queensland somewhere, um, to have that opportunity and the experience of doing that because we're very well looked after on the Central Coast and um, people get cancer in Mongolia as well. Thank you, little can I friend. Sit down? You may now sit down. I can sit. Sorry. Can I go down there if I yes. got to sit here? No, no, you can go wherever you want. You're the boss. Done, so. <laughs> okay. So I would now like to invite Professor Nick Goodwin, Jacqueline Jagger, and Dr. Michael Berg to the stage, please. So, uh, Professor Nick Goodwin who's this distinguished gentleman here, um, <laughs> is the director of the Central Coast uh, Research Institute for Integrated Care and also the director of the research um, at, sorry, director of, of research at the Central Coast Local Health District. Uh, he's a global leader and researcher in the field of integrated health services over the past 25 years, but now I'm hoping that he's the director of the entire place. He can actually relax a bit and um, let hard work be done by the high achievers you're about to introduce. So I will introduce, I will get you to say a few words about what you do, Nick. Well, thank you, Epsar. And, um also, thank you to. Yeah, I won't sing though. It's okay. <laughs> but also, thank you to you, Yvonne, again for your your generous work with the university and also with the Central Coast Local Health District. It's always a great pleasure to be here and to work with you. Um, as director of research for the local health district and in the role with the research institute, what's really key for me is to ensure that research that we do translates into impacting on the health and well-being of the communities that we serve. So the best projects that we see start from a small seed, usually driven by dedicated clinicians working within the sector who recognize that there is something that we can do better. And as a result of that, they have this inquiring mind. And it's my job to be able to provide opportunities and capacity and resources for them to build their capacity and skills and networks in order to follow those dreams. And uh, if you get it right, you can make a really significant difference to people's lives. 
Um, within the district, we've really now developing a, a quite a vibrant clinical trials program, and that's true across New South Wales. Um, and I guess our oncology units in particular have really quite a, a, a significant growth in that, and we want to be able to do that. But it's not just about the discovery science for how we cure and treat people. I think what we see every day is that cancer is becoming more of a, more of a chronic disease. People are living um, and have this lived experience of cancer over a number of years and live with it and, and recover from it and so on. But it's not always an easy experience for them. So for a lot of the work that I'm interested in doing is how do we improve that care experience? How do we ensure people get the services in the right way? How do we make it so that they can be um, as productive members of their family and a society that they want? These are the sorts of projects that motivate me. So I'm now going to introduce, and I'll, do one, I'll say one more thing. It's fantastic that you're putting some money into research because I think if we're able to do those seed fundings and move that through to things that can really change the world, then it started here. So the next project is potentially one of those. So I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jackie Jagger, to tell you a little bit about the research that we've been doing on multiple myeloma. Jackie. Thanks, Nick. And I've got some notes to read from my apologise in advance. It's been a big, long week. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank very much Christani um, Scholarships for, um, for choosing our project to go forward and also the generous donors, um, many of here I'm sure will be here this evening. Um, we've had great support from the Central Coast Research, Research Institute and I'm really lucky to work with a very dedicated team um, of my co-investigators, primarily Emma Parr, who is in the audience with me, one of our haematology nurses, and Dr. Jenny King, who's been fundamental in, in moving me forward from a, uh, in, to a fledgling researcher and having research under my belt thoroughly. Um, the, the study was born out of really my experience with working with myeloma patients for almost 30 years, which is quite um, a worry in itself. Um, my, and for those people that don't know, myeloma is an incurable cancer. It's a cancer of, of one of the blood cells. And although it's an incurable cancer, it's a highly treatable cancer. Um, the, the median survival has changed dramatically in the time that I've looked after patients. People lived for around nine to 12 months, 30 years ago. And now I look after people who are living in the second decade of their lives with myeloma. Um, unfortunately, they're not always years that are really years that are lived well. They're often years that are um, on treatment. Um, so we've, many of my 30 years has been seeing people who struggle with quite arduous treatments and many times are in hospital settings having chemotherapy or, or supportive care, sometimes as much as twice a week. One of those um, treatments that um, patients receive is a, a drug called bortezomib, which is a subcutaneous chemotherapy, and sometimes that's a twice-weekly injection. It's not as easy to come into a cancer day unit just to come at your appointment time, go in for your injection and walk away. We've got incredibly busy services. Our, our cancer day unit has increased capacity by, it's nearly, it's about 96% in the last five years. So we've not necessarily had resources that, that cater to that. So patients wait a long time. This patient group is really highly immunosuppressed, so infection is a big problem. It's a big worry for them, so especially when they're sat in a, in a hospital waiting room with lots of sick people. Um, and they um, have many symptoms to contend with. So I did an audit a few years ago, realized we had horrendous waiting times and thought we can do better. Um, realizing that as a cancer service, we needed to change our model of care. I had the opportunity to participate in a knowledge translation scholarship, which was really the seed that helped me to be able to translate the knowledge that was already out there, the evidence that was around the world, and then also recognize what was missing. And from that came our study, which is um, how to teach patients to give the injections themselves at home with without losing any support because we do t telehealth monitoring and ensure there's close monitoring around the, the, the administration process. Very differently for our project too is that we'll teach the carer. If we have patients who can't give the chemotherapy themselves, 
but they have a really good carer who's happy to do it, we'll train them. There's always been a big barrier because people worry about chemotherapy, they worry about people being exposed to drugs, so we overcame a lot of barriers. And we've developed a self-administration program that is really providing comprehensive education and support for this patient group. Our preliminary, preliminary I always struggle with that word, <laughs> preliminary data um, tells us that patients love the service, they tell us all the time. Um, they, they think the model of care is great and it's safe, our safety data is really good. We've only had one minor thing, whereas the patient managed to inject his finger on the way to the tummy. That was the only thing. Oh, the rest has been good. We're about to recruit a research assistant um, who will complete our data entry. We've recruited 22 of 25 patients for our pilot study. Um, and then we'll, we will recruit a health economist who will help us undertake an economic evaluation of this alternate model of care. The, the funding from Crustani scholarships particularly is going to provide us with an opportunity to collect um, narrative stories from a sample of our study group. Narrative storytelling is a, an important method of obtaining really rich quality data uh, that tells us the true experience of patients, strengthening and sometimes um, transforming our ways of working. Uh, Understanding and recording storytelling about the non-monetary value of chemotherapy at home is vital. It needs, we need to be able to recognize that, <coughs> excuse me, and demonstrate it because there's going to be a, a big cost benefit shown which isn't financial. It's going to be about the increased confidence, the reduction in anxiety, the less worry about infection risk with every hospital visit and indeed the time saved to live life that is precious rather than sitting in a waiting room. So my last words, I'm a bit of a bookie, so finally, in the words of Margaret Atwood, in the end, we'll all become stories. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. If, if you could just actually stay there for a second, I just got a couple of questions for you. Um, so first of all, congratulations on the amazing work. Um, I think particularly as a clinician, uh, one of the things that I actually always realise is that there's so many things that we could do better because we get into that habit of we've done this for 50 years the same way and so we should continue to go. And there's so much opportunity for making things efficient and better for the patients. So well done. Um, the first question I wanted to... Well, actually, you're a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. Um, so could you please uh, maybe explain to the audience what a nurse practitioner is as opposed to a uh, enrolled nurse or a clinical um, registered nurse and what are the hurdles that you had to jump through to get to the point that you're at? Well, there's two explanations for a nurse practitioner. There's one that I say to patients, which means I've just been around an awful long time and quite long in the tooth. <laughs> and then there's the fact that you, um, you it, it's the culmination of years of experience. I've, I've been a cancer nurse for 30 years and a, a nurse for, for a few more than that. Um, but, it, but there are quite a few hurdles to jump through as a nurse practitioner, and I think it's getting easier over time, and we've got a lot of people in this room committed to making it easier. Um, you, it's, it's not only the years of experience, um, many jobs, many being able to demonstrate that you're a leader, demonstrate that you do ad, ad advanced practice and then do a master's degree at the end of having already done numerous degrees in your, in your um, career. Um, but um, being a nurse practitioner is, uh, I think it's, I'm very lucky um, to be a nurse practitioner. It's a really special role where you can take and harness all that years of experience of delivering bedside care but then also take that next step of prescribing the drug you think you need the patient needs monitoring the symptoms changing the treatment pattern all in collaboration with your colleagues we have a wonderful collaborative team um, it's not a, a nurse practitioner is not somebody who is instead of a doctor it's working collaboratively with to make sure the patient gets the best possible care a, a more timely manner I think is probably the thing mm. up Sarah and, and I think obviously we're extremely lucky to have you um, 
uh, in the Central Coast Cancer Services. Um, and one of the things, that, however, is like I assume your clinical practice is hugely busy, as with most of us, we, we have to kind of fit in clinical research and education and training and all of these things on the side somewhere, you know, and it's typically after hours and on a weekend. Um, what are the barriers that you face as a nurse practitioner in your busy clinical practice in doing clinical research um, for our patients and how has the Crestani Foundation scholarships in particular helped you with that? Um, you're absolutely right and the clinical load is, is huge. I see between 15 and 20 patients a, a day um, doing formal pre-chemo consults for many of those or, 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 or treatment um, um, evaluations. Um, I think funding to be able to uh, employ people to do the legwork where you can really become the person that has the ideas, puts the ideas into paper and then you can help uh, with, with help from others and funding can and drive forward with research assistance and having the right people in your team. I'm, I'm very much the right person from some perspectives, but I'm not the, the skilled researcher, I'm not the, the, the health economist and be, having funding to be able to get the right people in your team is, is exceptionally important. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now I would like to invite Dr. Michael Burke, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Biomedical Sciences and Pharmacy at the University of Newcastle. Um, so your main area of interest is vascular disease. Yeah, and he's, so his projects range actually from international clinical trials testing new treatments to primary preclinical research into disease mechanisms. So I'll let you take the stage and ask you some questions. Thank you very much, Apsara, um, and thank you everyone. Welcome to the Institute if you haven't been here before, and welcome back if you have been here previously. Uh, it's an honour to chat with you tonight uh, and to introduce, um, I mean, to, to keep that discussion going with Yvonne. Um, thank you very much for everything, Yvonne, this year, and congratulations to your big year as well. Um, I think what I could chat to you about, I know we've got a very tight schedule tonight, um, and I don't want to talk too much, um, is just to kind of introduce myself, what I do as um, a biomedical science researcher and lecturer on the Central Coast. I largely um, research in the area of vascular disease, vascular pathology, um, but as we know, cancer is a complex disease. And as a biomedical researcher, I've got the opportunity to um, with my colleagues, look at reasons why things might happen, um, why a disorder might happen, so we can maybe have a look at mechanisms or uh, capacities for us to actually change um, the actual, or to look at why, why it happen, happens from a genetic perspective, so we can p potentially prevent a disease happening, a, a certain type of cancer happening. Um, and I think I've probably taken a few of you through the Institute previously to show you some of the amazing tools we have upstairs, some of the um, genomic sequencing things that we have um, that we hope to get up off the ground in the next few years. Another side of research um, that I um, am doing in terms of my relationship with cancer oncology research um, is looking at how we can actually optimise the treatment for many of the cancer um, sufferers that, that we know um, is an increasing thing. We know age is one of the risk factors of cancer. We've got an ageing population. Um, one in eight women will be uh, diagnosed with breast cancer by the age of 85 and one in six men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer by the age of 85. So these disorders are growing. Um, we know that colorectal cancer after lung cancer is the biggest killer. So um, how, what can we do as biomedical scientists to, scientists to look at why these things are happening and um, how better to optimise our treatment, whether it's from a chemotherapy perspective, whether it's from you know, using our understanding of anatomy to maybe deliver a drug better to something like a, um, a liver cancer, so intrahepatic vascular targeting of, um, of certain cancers, but also um, looking at some of the downstream kind of complications of procedures, so not only optimising our um, operative technique with, with cancers, but also um, managing the uh, consequences of having a procedure. You may or may not know that some of the complications with um, taking out lymph nodes, if a disease uh, for cancer does metastasize to a lymph nodes, is swelling. Um, and as a vascular scientist, we deal a lot with swelling in the limbs. Um, and one of, one of my students this year has actually um, piloted a, a, a kind of trial on the Central Coast to look at why particular patients suffering from diseases like venous insufficiency, but also lymphedema secondary to cancer, um, cancer uh, surgeries might um, 
uh, why, why they might be wearing compression stockings and what, what might be some of the barriers that um, prevent them from actually doing that and how that might be locally dependent. So again, all of these research ideas that we do, they're complex, it's hard to kind of talk to um, different audiences about it sometimes. So thank you very much for coming. It's a great opportunity for us to get you into our institute, uh, show you some of the things firsthand what we're doing. Massive congratulations to our recipients tonight. You guys are going to be at the coal face of the work and um, it really is an inspiration to see this, but also it's an inspiration to see everyone here, especially the donors uh, um, and what you're doing. You know, none of this research can be done without the funding that you guys do. So massive congratulations to everyone. Thank you again and dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> He's a salesman too. Um, <laughs> so actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is obviously Jackie's told us what she does and it's actually very much patient-facing clinical research. Um, and sometimes that's the kind of the sexier end of the research because people can actually see what happens and it's, it's very much outcome focused. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the audience what the difference is between, say, perhaps lab or uh, you know, cellular research, translational research, preclinical research, and finally clinical research? You know, Sukhsing Tui, I know you could probably talk about it for five years. Yeah, but... I have a habit of, of going on um, sometimes, so um, let me know when you need to move on. But um, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, so some of, some of the preclinical work that we can do um, is looking at things like risk factors, the epidemiological understanding of why we have certain prevalences. like. When you mentioned about the liver cancer in Mongolia, immediately I wanted to know why that is why that is a case. So looking at prevalence, incidences, differences between different demographics in Australia from a preclinical perspective, um, you know, targeted understanding of particular patients' genetic um, makeup, why they might develop a particular type of cancer or subtype of cancer, or and or why they might benefit from a particular type of medication that might be targeted to a particular receptor or something to do with the disease. Um, a lot of the other research can be done that backs up our understanding can be done in, in animal models or cell culture models. One of the great things that we have upstairs, if you've managed to go up into the laboratories, I know we're not doing a tour tonight, but um, there might be opportunities in the future, we have cell culture um, capacity. So we can actually grow different types of cancerous cell lines and expose them to different what we call cytotoxic drugs um, to see whether a particular subtype of cell might be more susceptible to dying from or after exposure to a particular medication, which is wonderful to do. Um, and then some of the clinical things that we can do, once we've you know, maybe modelled some things based on that information, we can then um, translate some of that into practice. So some of the optimisation of surgical practices, um, some of the optimisation of post-surgical care, as I spoke of before, uh, and many other things. Mm. So hopefully that answers your No, ab absolutely. And I think, um, Nick, so as the director of all of this, um, can you maybe perhaps tell the audience um, what is the importance of actually kind of you know, understanding and supporting and funding all of the spectrum through and through. I, the return on investment for research is, is remarkable. Um, and I think you have to look at it in a number of different ways. So I think in clinical trials, I think for almost every dollar that you invest, you get about $7 worth back in advantages. And here on the coast, we're really keen to understand our impact in a lot more meaningful way. Um, so we're working with colleagues to work through how can we assess our impact? Because it's one thing to know that we're doing a good job and we feel it every day in our, in our professional lives and our patients tell us when we're doing a bad job quite regularly <laughs> um, and quite clearly. However, we need to have those objective measures. So if we have the narrative stories for multi-myeloma sufferers, if we understand the impact that it's having on the quality of our services or the effectiveness of the care pathways that people travel or the outcomes that people have and the experiences that they... If we can gather all of that information, even from the smaller studies that you've funded here today, that can lead to such significant outcomes for our community. And so for me, re research is the cornerstone of a highly impactful health district mm. um, and working with our colleagues at the University of Newcastle in particular and with all of the amazing facilities that we have here on the central coast, particularly up on level 11 in Michael's unit, 
it's all where the goodies are stored, <laughs> um, you can actually work wonders. So it's, it's mm. a fantastic and privileged place mm. to, to support research. But at the end of the day, after a year or two years or three years, and you look yourself in the mirror, have we been able to make a difference to people's lives mm. is the question. And if you can say yes, even if it's affecting one or two lives, you can feel that you've potentially done an amazing job and at the same time built research pathways for the inquiring mind, whether they're clinicians or professionals working in the district or um, mm. young university graduates who recognise that research is a career for them, we want to take that seed and run with it. Because mm. we don't have enough researchers. Yep. And the people who are busy at the coalface like Jackie need that support mm. to grow the research. So mm. it's uh, amazingly impactful. Yeah. And I just actually um, it will hang, hang out there for a second, but um, I just actually wanted to give a very quick story about why this is so impactful because, again, people don't recognise how many decades of work goes into something before it becomes that, you know, sexy story on current affair or news um, that sort of said, oh, this new drug is on the market. Um, I remember when I was actually studying for my fellowship exam in radiation oncology, for some reason I also needed to know the medical oncology trials. Um, and back then, this was about 2011, um, um, if you had metastatic melanoma, it, it was a, very much a death sentence and people only had weeks to live um, when we met them. And so really apart from instead of saying, you know, sprinkle some holy water and sort of said enjoy the rest of your life, there really wasn't much you could actually kind of do for these patients. And I remember like, you know, feeling sorry for myself studying about the 25th negative trial in metastatic melanoma. And I was wondering why on earth are they going to put another, t how many of a billions of dollars to the 26th trial, you know, when 25 has been negative. And I was a bit arrogant and young then, you know, I've learned my lesson because about a year after that, the 26th clinical trial happened to be the thing that actually identified the BRAF mutation in metastatic melanoma and introduced immunotherapy to the world. And immunotherapy since then has changed the cancer game immensely. So we now again have people living for years with metastatic melanoma when it wasn't even thought to be a possibility. And again, 2011 wasn't that long ago. But the years of 25 clinical trials, again, going back to the where it started in a lab with a cell and went to some you know, um, animal studies, perhaps, and preclinical studies and clinical studies, um, I just wanted to thank these amazing researchers for the work that they do um, so we can actually treat our patients effectively every day. So thank you. OK. Um, so we are now on to the next exciting section. So, um, again, as I was sort of saying before, when I first met Yvonne and the Crestani Scholarships Foundation, it was in the context of me being the head of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Central Coast Cancer Centre. And when I first met Yvonne, what was clear was that the Crestani Scholarships Foundation at the time was only solely focused on radiation therapists um, because it was Chris Crestani's legacy that she was honouring. So I kind of, um, I didn't know Yvonne very well back then, so I kind of talked to her and the, the team and sort of said, hey, I'm not 100% understanding why is it, I mean, I understand the legacy of Chris, but is there a possibility of actually extending the scholarships to the rest of the team? Because again, as any clinician here knows, it takes an entire team of like, huge amount of professionals to get one patient through their diagnosis to their treatment to their survivorship. Um, and so when we actually asked that question, my thought process was, if the Crestani scholarships are trying to improve patient outcome through education um, of radiation therapist, is it really worthwhile just only kind of you know, greasing one cog of the wheel or do we need to actually strengthen the entire team? Um, and Yvonne, as always, and the board actually kind of listened um, and they were happy to extend the, the scholarship. So again, um, Mick Crestani, who was Chris's brother and um, Yvonne's lovely brother-in-law, um, he was actually an engineer at the time. He passed away. We gave a physics scholarship in his honour. Um, and now it has actually also brought a new initiative, which is the nursing scholarship. So it's an honour to invite Professor Amanda Johnson to tell us about the Crestani scholarships in oncology nursing. Amanda is the head of school and the dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery at UON. Um, so welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Nurses, 
We're pivotal to the care of people who have cancer. And many of you will have um, met many nurses in your time, and many of you will have been impacted by cancer and the death of a loved one or a friend that you have known during your time. Unfortunately, one in two um, people have a diagnosis in New South Wales of some form of cancer. There are 49,000 cases annually. And in Central Coast, we have about 14,000 people diagnosed with cancer each year. And unfortunately, we have more cancer diagnosis than any other area within New South Wales. So it's really pivotal that we have um, the opportunity to educate the future generation of specialist oncology nurses, and that starts in the undergraduate program. And I'm very um, pleased to be able to have been working with Yvonne to be able to establish the scholarship so that the students of the University of Newcastle School have that opportunity. And it actually gives us a difference to many other nursing schools across Australia. So thank you for that. I'd also like to say that it's important that we have scholarships for nurses because they are frequently first in family to the university sector. They're frequently um, not from school and so they have carer and mortgage responsibilities. And frequently in this area in particular, they come from in an Indigenous background. And so for those reasons, having scholarships is extremely important to support our undergraduate nurses to be able to undertake their education in a way that, it, that allows them to focus on their education to, and to excel. It's also very important that we develop an interest in oncology or cancer nursing so that hopefully an undergraduate student when they graduate goes on to then undertake postgraduate education in oncology nursing and then becomes nurse practitioners. And on the note of nurse practitioners, I'm very pleased to announce that in 2024, the university will have 90 um, students taking nurse practitioner program, and that's triple the number that we've been able to do in the past. So through the scholarship, I'm hopeful that in time to come, we'll have some graduates out of that program that are also oncology specialists. And, um, and I think that that will be very important for the Central Coast um, region in particular. Nurses um, are very much about undertaking the assessments of people that have cancer. They administer a variety of um, treatments they engage in communication with family, friends, and with the individual. They plan their care, they coordinate the care and coordinate the multidisciplinary team. They provide education, not only to the individual, the family, and the wider community. They monitor for side effects around the range of treatments that people with cancer have to engage in. And so they are the, the link pin, if you like, they're the, the core role that brings all of the other um, disciplines and health professionals together. They also have, um, they also intersect with people at, ver at various points across the illness trajectory. So it might be in the initial oncologist office as the nurse um, practice um, uh, registered nurse. It might be through screening um, activities that they engage in. It might be at the staging time. It might be in the delivery of chemo or radiation um, therapies. It might be follow-up post um, various surgical um, procedures. It's also about the survivorship. It's also about caring for the person when they're dying and they're in the palliative phase. So nurses are pivotal to the illness trajectory when someone has cancer and you'll meet them at each of those points as the person proceeds through um, their cancer journey. So it is very important from, um, from a, a, a scholarship point of view that as we move forward and we see the financial pressures that are being created within our community for a, a range of reasons, the Commonwealth Government is undertaking a review of education and it's looking at a, what they call a university accord. 
and the Council of Deans, Nursing and Midwifery have spoken strongly about what is being coined placement poverty. So students frequently have to undertake placement and when they do that, they are often having to give up their paid job. Most of our students at this university engage in full-time studies and part-time work. And when they go on placement, it may be that they have to give up that paid employment for that period of time to undertake the placement. Having a scholarship allows some way of mitigating that financial pressure. So again, for, it is very important as we go forward that these types of scholarships are um, integral to supporting our students to be able to undertake um, placements and to be able to optimise their learning and to just relieve that pressure, particularly in the current um, climate. Um, with a lot of the um, economic pressures that um, people are facing. So Yvonne, you're a registered nurse and I think it's great that we have an oncology nursing scholarship and I thank you for that um, vision. Thank you. Yvonne, so Yvonne, if you would like to come up. May I present Paris Neville. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and it's just lovely for you. Um, I hope, wish you all the well for you. your future. And that's for you and your future. Congratulations, it's wonderful. And she's the inaugural recipient of this um, scholarship, so we look forward to hearing great things in 2024. <laughs>I actually just wanted to ask you a question though. I um, understand that, well congratulations first of all, um, and I understand that um, your motivation to wanting to do oncology nursing is one that is actually personal. If you don't mind, would you share with us, we'd be honoured if you could actually tell us what that was. Um, I have quite a personal experience with cancer. My pop unfortunately lost his battle to melanoma and it's just, I've seen all the beautiful oncology nurses and everyone in the field just show great like kindness and empathy towards him and I'm just really excited to hopefully have that effect on someone else's life one day. So yeah. Thank you. Um, and again what, what you may not know is that Yvonne um, is actually a nurse and we've heard that from Amanda before as well. And Yvonne actually, you know, nursed um, Chris through his entire cancer um, journey and also at the end of his life. Um, and I think what I wanted to actually kind of tell you is b this personal motivation sometimes can be, a, can feel like a bit of a burden because it, it's, it's so much and you want to help not only the people you love, but you want to actually help the world. Um, and it can feel like a huge responsibility that you're actually carrying. Um, but looking at this lady, when I actually spoke to Paris this morning, I sort of said, well, you're probably like a Yvonne Crestani, you know, about 70 years younger, but um, <laughs> you're like a young Yvonne Crestani where your personal motivation and that deep personal connection that you actually have with cancer will hopefully actually drive you to do great things um, beyond your family, beyond your community, but again, for the entire you know, cancer community. So we are very grateful and we look forward to seeing what you achieve in the future. Um, I think you can go now. I'll, I'll get you back again. I've got to ask Glennis. Oh, Glennis, can she go now? Can I go? Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Kathy Fletcher and Yolanda, Professor Yolanda Surgeon. <laughs> now, um, so Kathy is the Chief Radiation Therapist at the Central Coast Cancer Centre, and I have the fortune of working with her. Um, and she and hosts dancing with me. and dancing with her. Um, <laughs> Um, and she uh, hosts the, the young students who actually come to our centre. Professor Yolanda Surgeon is the Head of Discipline of Radiation Therapy and the Director of Global Centre for Research and Training in Radiation Oncology at UON. 
Now, those of you who have attended uh, this scholarships evening before know that about, I don't know, 10 years ago before COVID, um, the, I, I wore an extremely blingy shoe to one of these events. And Yolanda, I wasn't looking for trouble, I wasn't looking for competition, but she started one. And so, so every year the stakes have gone up. One year, mind you, she was in a moon boot, so I thought it was an unfair disadvantage, so we let it go. Um, and I called her recently to say, and I sort of said, well, what shoes are you wearing this year, Yolanda? And she said, well, I'm not telling you. And she said, whatever it is, I can tell you that it will hurt like hell. I won't be able to walk on Saturday, but it will be worth it. <laughs> so I think you have done fabulously well. <laughs> Except... Um, Except she sort of said, came in and she wasn't putting it on because she wasn't showing me. So I sort of said, she goes, I've got something in this black bag that I'm not going to actually show you. Do you have anything in a black bag? And I says, I've got something in a white bag that I will show you. And this was my Friday casual shoe that I was wearing <laughs> for work today. So watch and weep because there's a pearl in the heel. There is a pearl and an embellishment on the top. So... Anyways, me. just saying. Excuse me. <laughs> so, Glenis, I know you're running a tight ship, but I have to tell the story as it was. So I received a phone call earlier this week from Apsara on the pretense that he, she wanted to ask what we would discuss on the stage. But the reality of it was that she was trying to get from me what shoes, what colour, what do they look like, how high were they? It's that a competition, the, you know, yeah, you just right. don't that's leave right. things to chance. Have a seat, Yolanda. <laughs> so, Cathy, um, could you please just briefly tell us what the students do when they actually come to the Central Coast Cancer Centre as part of the Christiani Scholarships? In my very sensible shoes, I won't have bunions. I won't have sore feet tomorrow. We know who really does Nothing the work around here. Nothing new can't fix. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so the question was, what do the students do yeah. when they come? So, um, Maddie and Sam, you can see up there on the screen. Maddie's the really happy girl at the front. <laughs> Sam's the little eyes you can see at the back. They attended our centre for seven days about seven hours per session um, and in those sessions they were exposed to the entire journey of a patient or actually several patients um, that we were treating for stereotact what we call SRS and SABR. So SRS is stereotactic radiosurgery, um, radiation therapy, we're done with radiation therapy, extremely small volumes, very high doses, very short fractions or numbers of treatments. And the Sabre treatments um, are stereotactic, obl stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, again done the same way but quite often in areas that aren't um, in the cranium. So they're areas like lungs, liver, bones, prostate. And they were exposed to, it, both of them were exposed on separate occasions, one on one, they didn't have to come together, they came on their own. And we, we put them through the entire pathway that a patient would, a patient journey. So when they go to uni, they get, well, they get the, I, I suppose they get, Yolanda can tell you what they get. <laughs> <laughs> they get the, they it's get been the a while education, since they get the uni. real <laughs> education when they come out and they get to see patients and they're exposed to doctors, nurses, physicists. Um, IT guys, the admin staff at the front, the patients every single day. And what it means to them, um, I've actually got a few letters that have come that I saw sent this week to Yvonne, that were just beautiful, that had come from the students, um, or graduates, I should say. But what happens when they come in each day is the first thing they do is they get to see um, a consult, and they sit in on a consult with a doctor, a radiation oncology specialist, um, who will sit with the patient and talk to the patient with the student there and include them. The patient leaves the room and the oncologist spent time with them to talk to them about how they localise the tumour, what the like or pa like likely pathway for treatment's going to be. Um, they talk about the diagnostic imaging and tests so they get to hear the whole rambit of how the doctor is going to make decisions. The second part of the patient's journey is when they come, the patient comes back in to have their CT simulation. So we bring the patient in, they spend about an hour with us. They might have special masks or stabilisations done. The students are hands-on in, hands in the team making those casts with these patients. 
quite often um, the stereotactic patients, particularly liver, I heard some talk about liver today, um, particularly liver patients will have um, a lot of movement, so it's kind of like trying to hit a moving target. So in order to hit that moving target, we will do a lot of motion management. Patients hold their breath. There's specific techniques we, we use to capture the images when we're doing that, um, and the students get to work through that whole part. The third stage is they come in and they, we have our radiotherapy planning. So all the radiation therapists sit down with all of the data that they've collected, with the doctor who marks up the volume, with the radiation therapist who mark up the areas of interest that we need to protect in those areas as well. As you know, radiation goes in one side, out the other, and through anything that gets in its way. So we have to make sure we protect the other organs. They're taught how to do that on an extremely complex case. It is the most complex type of treatment that are being delivered, and I'm really happy to say that we were the first in New South Wales um, to deliver liver, liver stereotactic treatment, and a lot of that is due to the fact that the Crestani Foundation have supported us since we opened in 2013, and they've sent one, of, one or two of our staff to national and international conferences. So we've had that exposure to those really complex therapies, and it's been really helpful. Um, and then, <laughs> stage four, there's more. <laughs> Keep going. Stage four <laughs> is they would sit with the physicists and they would have their, they would learn the quality assurance. Like these machines are extremely technical, highly um, technical machines, and they sit with the physicists who show them how they do the quality assurance. Radiation is extremely highly regulated um, industry, so we have to be very careful about how we check that we're delivering what we're planning on delivering. Um, that's not with the patient there, but then they come back again on the patient's first day of treatment. They sit with the doctor, the radiation therapist, the physicist and the patient, and they, they deliver the treatment with them, alongside them. They get to learn. They just get, they get so much exposure. I get excited. It gives me goosebumps. I get excited for them. Our own staff don't often get that until they're about four or five years out and really, um, you know, doing all the routine therapies regularly. But these guys get hands-on. And you know what? They're turning up to us with a really, like, good job, Yolanda and Debbie here. I can see in the audience as well from the uni. Um, these students are turning up really well educated, but what they do get out of coming to us is the actual hands-on experience. And they get to sit with these specialists who are so busy and have very little time, but they drop everything for when these students come in to make sure they have a good experience. Thank you, Cathy. Again, amazing. Thank you. Um, and I must admit again, you know, I think what you guys will find is when you actually do come to this place, um, they really do become part of the team. And particularly as a student walking into a professional setting, it's one of the most intimidating things you can do because you're kind of like, particularly as medical students, and Gordon, you would have remembered this, you'd kind of go, Am I visible? Why are they seeing me? Why are they talking to me? I thought I was invisible. Why aren't I blending in with a wall? You know, can they see me? Can they talk to me? Um, and so to actually come and be able to like talk to people and work with people at an mm. equal level with the professional team is an amazing opportunity. Now, Yolanda, I wanted to... So last weekend you were in Melbourne for the Medical Radiation Practice Board of Australia meeting. You were telling me that there were some key challenges that face radiation therapists as a group. Could you please elaborate a bit on that so we can actually ask you a question about how this helps the students? I can. Yeah, thanks, Apsara. Um, so, so you're quite right. On Friday of last week, I was in Melbourne and I attended the MRPBA, which is the Medical Radiation Practice Board of Australia um, Summit on Workforce, where we had a discussion that's been going on for quite a while now, the discussion around the current workforce um, issues that we have for radiation therapists and for radiation oncologists also. So for those of you that keep up with some of the government reports, um, there has been a report that has just been published. It's called the Skills Priority List, which tells us that in 2022 and in 2023, across all territories and all states of Australia, there's a significant shortage of radiation therapists and a significant shortage of radiation oncologists. And so what that means in the short term is that our workforce, so Cathy and Cathy's team, are working incredibly hard to make sure that the patients don't miss out on the benefits of radiation therapy. What it means in the long term, I don't really want to even think about that. So we're working really hard. Uh, and by we, I mean the university or the universities, uh, TAFE, 
um, the MRPBA, ASMA, the clinicians to find a solution and of course government as well. And so one of the solutions could possibly be that we train some really clever individuals who do not have a degree in radiation therapy, for instance, to be allied health assistants to help out the radiation therapists, the radiation oncologists to get the job done. So that was a particularly important day that we attended and there's far more of those to attend, uh, but also a lot of work to be done. Hmm. Thank you. So I think the reason why I wanted to actually kind of bring that up was because the advantage that these scholarship recipients are getting is that it's going to be an extremely competitive um, employment market. Um, and so when everyone graduates with the same degree and everyone graduates with the same level of skill set, these guys are going to actually have a massive advantage when they need to actually get that first job. Um, and I think, again, this is why I'd again like to thank Yvonne and her team for giving them the advantage that's not only going to shape their future, but again, the future of a, of a profession. Um, so thank you, Cathy. Cathy, I might get you to pop back up and I'll get you, Yolanda, to maybe tell us about the radiation therapy scholarships from UON. Oh, well. Thank you. So, so it's good to see everybody again. This is, I believe, my sixth year running that I've been here physically. So thank you, Yvonne. Um, and in saying that, we have almost 20 scholarships that have been awarded as a result of Yvonne and her team's generosity to radiation therapy students specifically. Um, this year we have four scholarships that we're awarding. Two of those are the Cancer Care Centre, the Central Coast Cancer Care Centre scholarships. One of those is a MRI uh, scholarship and the other one is a Rural Equity Scholarship as well. And we have the students here to present. And I, th I think uh, Yvonne asked me and Glenn has asked me to talk about the impact of these scholarships and I think it's quite broad but... If I had to think about one of the things that these scholarships um, have done for our students and in view of the current workforce issues is that they're, they're building on the curiosity that we want our health professionals to take into practice. And also I think that uh, we as radiation therapists are quite a unique and niche profession which means that uh, no, many people know what we do, which kind of feeds through to enrolment and attraction uh, into our programs. And now, more than ever, that's become a critical issue in terms of making sure that we, as the educators, uh, and Kath wasn't sure what we do, we teach them stuff, Kath, at the <laughs> university. <laughs> So when they come to you, they know stuff and you do stuff with that stuff. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and so it's really important for us and it's critical for me as the head of discipline to make sure that our profession, which is so, so important, if you think about one in two patients would benefit from radiation therapy. They're the stats, but in fact only one in three receive radiation therapy. That's how critical a profession it is that we work in. So... From my perspective, these scholarships, they build the students, for sure they do. They give them extra skills, some of which they would not get at the university through our curriculum. Uh, but also I think it creates that, that vision so these students can go out there and tell other people and other students and community members about the really excellent job that our clinical counterparts do and that we, we kind of contribute to that too. And let me just finish by saying that it's not just about the clinicians and quite right in acknowledging the researchers. I think once I became an academic, it became obvious to me that I had to kind of recenter myself and my daily purpose because I wasn't in front of patients every day. But the reality is that my purpose is still the patient. And I do that through my students. Researchers, it's still about the patient, despite the fact that they might be in a lab or, or they might be front facing, but it's still always about the patient. So it doesn't really matter whether you're management, research, academia or clinician, it's always about that patient-centered care. Thank you. Um, Yvonne, can I get you to please come up to stage?
Could the recipients please come back up again? And Paris, please. <laughs> now I would like to invite Dr. Judith Wiedenhofer. Jude is our keynote speaker for tonight. She's a senior lecturer at the School of Biomedical Science and Pharmacy. And Jude has led her own research group investigating new biomarkers that predict the disease progression of breast and prostate cancer. I'm very, very interested to hear what you have to say about this. <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. I think. Sorry. I Are we on time? No, we're no. not. Well, I'll try and be quick. <laughs> So, I mean, perhaps you can tell from my shoes that I'm at the non-sexy end of science. <laughs> so I, I do the lab stuff. Mike introduced it so beautifully for us earlier. And we do a few different things. Um, but one thing that I want to tell you about is what, um, I guess, intrigued Yvonne and the team enough to be kind enough and generous enough to give us a little bit of funding to continue what we're doing. So about 25,000 men in Australia this year got diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so when we think about that, that means at least 25,000 men got a prostate biopsy this year. Anyone want to put their hand up to go and get one? <laughs> no one really wants one. It's not enticing, but it is necessary. And what we want to do is make it not necessary. And so we're looking for a way to bypass that biopsy and get the same information, or in fact, preferably better information from a blood sample or perhaps a urine sample. No one wants to talk about urine right now. We're getting close to the refreshments, right? <laughs> so we're doing the discovery work. We're looking for what it is that we can find in your blood or in the blood of men that we can use to say you have prostate cancer. And what we really want to be able to do with that is say, what kind of prostate cancer do you have? Because it's, it's really not all the same. You know, there's, there's more than two types. But if we just categorise broadly and think about two types, we have the type which is unfortunately going to be very, very dangerous, very lethal, and, you know, be part of the contributing factor to around 4,000 men dying of prostate cancer in Australia every year. But if you do the quick maths, that means about 20,000 men get diagnosed and are still alive at the end of that year. But they've all had that biopsy. It has some nasty side effects in a high proportion of men. And then we need to work out how to treat them. Now, that's not my job. As I said, I'm at the, the other end. But what we can hopefully do is provide the information to work out how to treat them better. And so we're looking for something that says, you're going to have the nasty form or you're going to have the less nasty form. And that less nasty form, in some instances, can be so unnasty mm. that you would actually live longer than... No, which way do I put that? You don't need to be treated. You're going to die from beautiful old age, over 100, before that cancer is going to kill you. But that then causes some problems because how do you know which type you have? How can we be sure? And even with these biopsies, in a lot of cases, we're still not sure. And so it's then up to the, the beautiful teams that work in clinical settings and, and do all those beautiful things to help guide the patient on which journey they want to take. And that journey might involve what we call active surveillance, meaning you go and get blood tests frequently and you might have to go back for more biopsies. And we just monitor and say, are you stable or are you going to end up needing surgery or radiation or chemotherapy? Or it might be the choice to get in quick, get in early, have that cancer surgically removed and hope that that cures you and you don't progress. But unfortunately, that surgery, and in fact, radiation, also has some really nasty side effects for men. And so when we think about some of the other things we learn about from 
um, Jackie and Mike and Nick. Survivorship can be great, but it can also mean a loss of quality of life and you know, perhaps not the life that you were destined to lead. And so we want to find a way to identify that early so we can give men the best quality of life and the best outcome. And so we're doing the discovery work, we're working with those cells and those cell lines and things that Mike was talking about, and we're looking for what it is that switches and says you're going to have that nasty form or you're going to have that not so bad form. And if we can pick that in your blood pretty early on, then we can very confidently say, continue on your way, don't worry about your cancer, or you need to do something about it, you might not have a great quality of life, but at least you'll still be alive. And then later down the track, we're hoping to find a better way to treat it so we can avoid those effects on quality of life. So as Epsara said, this takes a long time. <laughs> I've been working here on the Central Coast doing this research for over 10 years, before that, I was working doing similar things in, in different parts in New South Wales. And we're still not there yet, unfortunately. But we feel we're getting close. And the funding that Cristani has been able to offer us has been a lifesaver. Because when you work with things like cells, you can't keep them alive without people and without money to keep feeding them. They're just like children. <laughs> And funnily enough, you know, sometimes university has to do things, maintenance, and they have to turn off the power and things. And they go, it's okay, we'll do it on the weekend because mm. there'll be nothing going on, we won't disrupt anything. And then we go, but our cells are still alive. They still need their power on the weekends. So these things need to keep going. And sometimes, you know, we don't keep them going. We freeze them at very low temperatures, like minus 196. But again, we have to fund that. We have to supply the liquid nitrogen to maintain that temperature. And so over this lifespan, we need money to do these things that aren't sexy, they're not interesting, but they're very important. And the way that funding in Australia works for medical research is as good as it can be, I guess, but it's not going to fund everyone and it doesn't fund everyone continually. And so without these beautiful donations from places like Cristani, those things get lost and then we have to start again. So it's really important to have this, and it's also really important to be able to help fund and support our students. So we talk about PhD students, people who are going to go on and become doctors, not the doctors that see the people, the doctors like me that see the, the bits of people. And, and those, those types of doctors, again, are doing it tough, like all the nurses and, and everyone else at the moment. They don't get a lot of money to do their work. They're trying to work full-time doing their research. They probably work on the side to actually support their family. And so getting top-up scholarships is also really handy because it gets them into the lab so they can focus on that activity and do the best that they can with it. So thank you very much to everyone for contributing. Thank you for listening. And I hope I didn't talk too long. It's, it's, it's clearly me who's actually talking too long. Um, and, uh, but I actually wanted to ask a couple of questions. So I'm a breast radiation oncologist and I do GI cancers. Um, so in the breast field and the prostate field, um, these cancers, although they're one of the, the, the two of the most common cancers and some patients don't do very well, overall we are actually doing amazingly in both of these cancer fields. Um, and that's why I'm not depressed as an oncologist because most of my patients live and they live very, very well. Um, however, there are other cancers that we are so far behind and there's so much work still to be done. Um, and in breast and prostate, we're looking at de-escalating treatments, so less and less treatment and keeping people well and in um, you know, good quality of life um, and avoiding unnecessary treatment and toxicity. What about, are you doing any work on any cancers that are actually the other spectrum where we need to actually escalate treatments and find out personalised medicine where we can sort of say this cancer needs a hell of a lot more than just kind of taking a bit of a relaxed approach of what we have at the moment, which is not achieving results? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously around the world there's lots of things going on, but personally here on the Central Coast and within the team that I work with, and clearly I'm not doing any of the actual work anymore, um, we're also interested in pancreatic cancer, and I don't know if many people know about pancreatic cancer, but it is probably, you know, if, if you rank all the cancers, and we heard, you know, breast and prostate, lung cancer, 
have some of the highest incidence, so most people being diagnosed each year. Pancreatic cancer is right down the other end of the scale. But then when you ask how many people die from that cancer each year, pancreatic cancer comes right up here to around number five. So it, it's pretty dismal to get that diagnosis right now. And that's because our treatments just aren't effective. And so we are looking and we're, we're looking for ways to personalise and not personalise as in be empathetic towards the patient because we don't see that patient. We're looking to say what is the specific type of pancreatic cancer that you have and mm. how best are we going to treat that? So you mentioned the clinical trials with metastatic melanoma and the, the landmark discovery of BRAF, which means probably nothing to most people in the room. We're looking for the next BRAF in pancreatic yep. cancer. We're looking for that thing that we can say, if you have this, we should treat you like this and we, sh we should do it from the start. Not at the point where we've run out of our standard options and we're now trialling whatever comes along. We should do this from the start and we should give you the best chance. Mm. So, yeah, we're, we're certainly doing that sort of thing. Well done. Again, um, you know, thank you. Um, I know you don't think the work that you do is actually sexy, but we do. Um, <laughs> because um, you make the work that we do actually look very sexy at the end of it. And again, um, you know, yep, just uh, amazing because... Um, again, how we used to actually do treatments based on population medicine, where we sort of said there's 100 people, of 100 people, 20% would actually get this, and therefore we should treat 100 people to just get four people to be alive, is not the way to go. We need to actually kind of find that 20 people and treat that 20 people and leave the other 80 people alone. Um, and I think this is where this is going, so thank you very much. Um, now... Actually, I think I have to uh, invite all of the speakers to now come up and have a photo. Right, thank you. Um, now, the next part is actually kind of uh, recognising and honouring our donors. And so, again, uh, thank you so much, because as you've heard throughout, the, throughout tonight, um, what Crestani Foundation does is all because of you. So, Yvonne, do you want to say something about that? And we will get the good people up? Well, we have a lot of people, as I said before, many people in this room contribute to what we do. And especially when we hear about, now we're introducing a nurse and these student radiation therapists and we're going into research now. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that Dr. Wen offer doesn't go into the sexy shoes because we need you there for the prostate. <laughs> <laughs> so all year round where we wait and hope when someone approaches us and says, can you help fund such and such a scholarship? So then we pray and say, where's the money coming from? So I would like to, in alphabetical order, read out the people, the, the donors, that support us so strongly. And by supporting us, you're supporting these clever people here in the university. And would, I'm asking you to come out, is that right? I'm going to read the things, and oh, you right. may stand here. Oh, and um, Did, did Glennis just... say? <coughs> Glennis, we good? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, I would like to invite Michael Bell, Bendigo Bank Franchise CEO, East Gosford, on behalf of Bendigo Bank. Next is um, Fred Bennett, friend of the Crestani Foundation. Fun fact, no, Fred's not here. Vic Alsi, president of the East Gosford Lions Club. Um, actually, we would like to also maybe invite uh, Vic's lovely wife, Wendy Alsey, to recognise your personal donations as well. <laughs> Next is Kevin Andrews, um, OAM, on behalf of the Gosford Masonic Centre. Um, and Harry and Wendy Medlicott. 
um, Joan Davis and Carol Stratford on behalf of the Inner Wheel Club of Wyong. Tom Perry, President on behalf of North Gosford Rotary Club. Alan Maddox, Station Manager on behalf of Radio Fibre Plus. Kylie Birkinshaw, President on behalf of Terrigal Evening CWA. Kylie's not here today, sorry. Yep. And uh, Kerry Dickens, owner of Victoria Black East Gosford. And Anu Chandra Mohan is actually one of the lovely volunteers with Crestani as well. <laughs> Um, and there are a few key donors who are not here tonight, but that needs to be mentioned. So Dr. Tucker and Pramila Singh Panwal, um, Dr. Eleonora Leopardi, um, Dr. Oh, sorry, not, not Dr. Erica Reen, who was previously mentioned. Actually, we, didn't, we forgot to tell about Erica, but I don't know whether you've got time to tell the story about Erica very quickly. Erica is, um, the reason why I mentioned this is Erica is one of the overseas donors to the Crestani Foundations. Um, and she is one of the people who actually pledged money for the international expansion of what we actually heard about Mongolia, for example. So maybe uh, I just thought this story was really funny. I know we are over time. Just very but briefly. Less food. Um, <laughs> when Apsara said earlier that I hang with some pretty different sort of people, and so it's been a wonderful experience. But we needed some overseas money, especially with research and the and new things that we're doing. But many years ago, over 20 years ago, I was in a travel club and I went overseas with a, a group that was a Central Coast travel club. And we used to go with 20 people to another country and stay with them. But before we did, we would be talking to them, emailing them, ringing them. So as who was going to host, because we were home hosted. So I was told that I would be staying with a lady called Maureen. So I was talking to Maureen on the email and making phone calls and getting to know Maureen because I was going to be living for a week in her home. So we, we flew into Connecticut onto the bus to where we were going to be picked up by our hosts. So 20 people got off the bus. People said, you're so-and-so, get in the car with your luggage, and off you went to their home. So I stepped off the bus, and this lady said, Yvonne, Yvonne, like that. <laughs> and I got in the car, and we're driving to her mansion in Connecticut, and I was saying, well, you know, is, what's that, Maureen? And, uh, you know, where do you live, Maureen? Do you have any children, Maureen? And after about half an hour, she said, what's this, Maureen? I'm not Maureen, I'm <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the story was that Maureen <laughs> got sick and they advertised for somebody to host an Australian so this lady said she'd never met an Australian before. She wanted to, she wanted to hear the accent. So, so she answered the, the ad and she decided that I was going to stay with her, but nobody told me she wasn't boring. <laughs> so I, we went into her home and she said, Oh, I'm so happy to have an Australian here, but I must tell you, I'm a bit disappointed. You just sound like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, she's been supporting us financially ever since. And I think, again, you know, this just goes to show the importance of relationships. Um, 25 years ago, a random encounter has actually led to years of friendship um, and years of support from a, a US citizen who has very little connection to the Central Coast, who has done amazing work both um, locally and um, globally. So again, you know, the world's our oyster. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Garth Sto uh, Stoneberg, 
Grant Wild, uh, Graham Martin, Megan Green, um, and Otto and Irene Stadelman, and also Susan McGregor, who are not here tonight. So again, once more, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so, yeah, so the next thing to do is to actually acknowledge some of our entertainers who are in the audience. Um, Yvonne, would you like to say something about them and uh, just what they do for your organisation? Well, when people support us and donate money, we let them know that we're not going to stand back and just ask for a handout. We work as well but to raise money but we can't do that without help. So we have an array here of entertainers and musicians, and it's through their generosity. They donate their talent so as we can make some money. So I'd like you to um, acknowledge them. Um, we have, here we, we have Steve. Um, Steve has a band, it's Mr. Mr. James Band, and right next to him is Lucky Star. I'm sure you've heard of Lucky Star. <laughs> and Claire Hayes, that's been with us for years and years, is always there for us, Claire. Tim Page. Tim Page is an operatic singer, and he muscles up some uh, entertainers for us and sings himself, and I've got your book for early in February. <laughs> So, and then we have again Darren and Isabella. They're Soroke, is that right? Soroke dancers, and they've jo joined us very recently. And they very graciously are here to entertain us, and they've offered their services for us. So, thank you all so much. If you could just all stand up and take a bow like you do in theatres, thank you. <laughs> uh, there is none, Lucky. You are the spotlight. <laughs> Please stand up and just... <laughs> Lovely. I think you've done that before, Lucky. <laughs> Now, the final group of people to actually acknowledge before you all get to eat, and I'm so sorry for keeping you all late, um, are actually the Crestani volunteers. Now, would you like to do the honours of asking? Sure. Yes. Um, I have wonderful volunteers. I could not do without them. And where are you all? You're all over there. There they are, the little darlings. <laughs> <laughs> I give them about, and some of them there at the back of the room, photographers, Lekka, who's always in trouble. Um, but, and who else here? Debbie. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I must tell you that, you know, some, we have meetings and we decide what's going to be happening, and we, we have a, a pretty good reputation, I can tell you. But every successful organisation must have a very efficient administrator. And I would like you, you've all met her and somehow or other, Glennis. Glennis, please come up here. <laughs> Glennis, Glennis gives us all a bad time. I'm sure you've all had emails and, and, and telephone calls from Glennis. We could not do without you. Oh, you we all do. We all do what Glennis tells us. And um, could all the other volunteers please she's come given, up and join these guys she's on stage? She's been giving us a hard time, and now she Emma. wants to speak. So <laughs> beware. Uh, just quickly, Clive. Whoa! Uh, just quickly, um, this is my eighth year go, go, with go. Ron, and um, it's amazing just what work we do. We have like, uh, a group of volunteers who are new people this year as well. So, good volunteers out there on the central coast just love coming to us. Um, but it's only because we have Yvonne. Thank you.
Okay, so that actually brings us to the end of the um, evening, but I would like to just th thank a few people. So Claire, um, thank you. I know you were trying to keep me into time, but that didn't work. Sorry. Um, Stephen Clark, our amazing town crier. Um, our speakers and the panel members, the scholarship recipients, wherever they are, they're over there. The donors, the entertainers, and the volunteers, and most importantly, you as the guests. Um, because without you, this night is nothing um, but just a collection of the same people who do the same thing. So thank you so much for coming and supporting all of us to actually kind of achieve these great things. Um, so what a great night it has been. I think the thing that I'm actually taking away from this is that we have actually acknowledged the legacy of those who have actually done so much for us so far, and some of them are not here with us tonight. We've recognized the tireless work of those who are actually currently dedicating their life's work to the improvement of cancer patients' outcome. And we are finally also celebrating the future potential of those who carry the hopes of our patients with them. And you might not know what you are going to be doing in the future, but you will do great things. So congratulations. Um, after tonight's performance, I'm sh not sure that I will actually be invited back. Um, so lovely knowing you all, and good night. <laughs> Let's give a round of appreciation for our brilliant MC, Dr. Atsara Windsor! <laughs>